Um, our speaker was expected to visit Toronto and Ottawa in person. Um, and we thought on a, we had on our minds a number of important pressing issues that um, uh, have been very important to the New Ezra Fund over the past decade. Uh, increasingly important, uh, increasingly important threats to Israeli democracy, the balance of uh, checks and balances, equality and fairness for everybody, religious freedom, socio and economic equality, you name it. Um, in particular, we've noticed an increasing amount of illiberalism coming out of Israel uh, in a way that, that threatens our understanding of uh, Jewish values, the role of a, of a Jewish and democratic state, um, attempts to centralize executive power, uh, efforts to delegitimize certain classes of citizens, particularly Arab citizens, uh, to defund or intimidate liberal groups, particularly civil society advocacy groups, uh, to attack and, and even delegitimize the courts and the media. So we had no idea that um, coronavirus would rise and change the way that we are all communicating. If you see my toddler jumping around in the background on the bed behind me, it's because we're all doing this uh, from, a, from a new place, uh, a, a new way of life. Um, we also had no idea that, um, that uh, COVID-19 would have uh, such dire effects in Israel, that in particular, certain actors in Israel, certain, um, uh, certain elements of Israel's government would use this crisis to deepen the things that we are concerned about. It would indeed, uh, as our speaker will tell you about, exploit them perhaps for, for, their, own event, for their own advantage. Um, we watch these efforts very, uh, very, very closely. And what we hope that you will see in today's uh, discussion between uh, Sharon Abraham Weiss and Natalie DeRosier is both the seriousness of these issues, but also the inspiring work being done to push back. That for every action there is a, there is a reaction and that Israeli civil society and that progressive Israelis are indeed pushing back and fighting back in creative and interesting ways and winning um, some important cases. So. Uh, allow me to, to, to introduce our speakers. Uh, first, we have, uh, as our moderator today, we have Natalie DeRosier, the principal of Massey College. Previously, she was Minister of Natural Resources and, Forest, and Forestry and uh, the Member of Provincial Parliament for Ottawa. Uh, entering, uh, prior to entering politics, she was the Dean of the Faculty of Law of the Common Law Section at the University of Ottawa. She also served as the general counsel for the CCLA, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, which is a national organization that acts as a watchdog for the protection of human rights and civil liberties in Canada, and is very much the, uh, the Canadian sibling to um, ACRI, the organization that we'll be speaking with today. Natalie is also a recipient of the Order of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So uh, we're delighted to have Natalie join us. Um, our guest speaker from Israel is Sharon Abraham Weiss. She's the executive director of ACRI, and ACRI is the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. It's the country's oldest, largest human rights organization, and the only one dealing with the entire spectrum of rights and civil liberties issue, issues in Israel and the occupied territories. They're also NIF of Canada and NIF Globally's flagship partner and our longest, uh, our longest running partner, Sharon herself is, uh, was a staff attorney uh, before she was executive director there. Uh, she represented ACRI in many principal cases, among them dealing with land issues, socioeconomic dignity, and workers' rights. She founded and led a, a legal clinic, and she's founded and led a feminist legal agency. She's been selected by The Marker and Haaretz newspapers as one of the most prominent and influential women leaders in Israel. We're delighted to have them both, Natalie and Sharon. Uh, please, the show is all yours. Oh, hold on. We have to. Uh... Um, to there, what, an now you're... what an honor it is to uh, to speak with uh, with Sharon today. I want to say a big admirer of the work that Acri is doing on difficult under difficult circumstances, and I we look forward to hearing. What's going on? What are the issues that you're fighting? Some of the strategies that you've used. I think we're always interested in what are the ways in which Canadians can help, but also how we get inspiration and look to Israel sometimes with some uh, worries uh, and, and want to continue to be fully aware of what's going on. But I want to start a little bit by asking you to tell, 
tell us about about yourself about uh how did you get to do this work and uh, uh before we get to covid 19. oh yeah hi uh, everybody thank you uh, so much for joining uh when we planned this visit a few months ago uh it seems as if the question were in order and made sense and now uh, i feel today with the covid 19 that uh for the past 10 days every day we're running a marathon and um to speak about the regular things why who am i it's a bit uh weird but uh i'll do my best so um so, so I'm, I've been here as the executive director of Acre in the past five years. Um, how did I get there? So I grew up in a lot in the south of Israel, and probably some people are asking themselves, really, people are really living there? Yes. And uh, I think growing up in the periphery of uh, Israel gives you uh, perspective. When I was 14, I moved to what I thought is the north, what we called is the north, which was De Boker in the Negev. And uh, it was the first time it was a boarding school and uh, pe uh, children from all over Israel were there. And for me, it was a cultural shock. As a strong student in my hometown in Elat, I became a very, um, uh, not very good student. And uh, I mean, it, it was the exposure to the uh, gaps in education and resources in Israel. Gives me a huge, gave me a huge shock at the time. Uh, but maybe better sooner than, than later, because I think that was for today, giving me the tools to do what I'm doing. Also, uh, my parents were both immigrants. My father came from India. My mother uh, is a descendant of Holocaust survivors uh, from Poland. So I think this background, being a daughter of migrants, living in a lot, um, gave me ideas about uh, equal opportunity. And I was lucky, lucky enough because you don't, I mean, I hope I'm talented as well, but I don't think it's only about talent. And talent. I think it's about circumstances. I think it's about uh, luck as well uh, to have the resources. And the reason that I'm working where I'm working today is, the, is because I believe that every uh, child, every girl or boy in Israel have the, op have the right to have the opportunity to uh, fulfill themselves and have uh, equal opportunity and, uh, and rights. Well, it's uh, it's uh, we know that you, we knew that you were an exciting figure in the, and that you had a great story. So we're so delighted that you are here with us at, um, today. Uh, let's talk about what's going on in Israel on on COVID nineteen and your marathon for the for the last little while. We know that Israel was one of the first countries to uh, impose travel restrictions. I've read that it, it is now tracking. Uh, the people who are uh, infected uh, and and doing so by uh, using what I see as a cell phone location, which is a pretty dire uh, measure to to do that. What's going on? What? How is the the situation unfolding? As you can, uh, as we know, it's unfolding, changing every day. Yeah. So uh, we, like the rest of the world, I mean, here is something about the global village we all live in. We heard during January about what is happening in China. We followed on the television and we started asking ourselves, it was clear that it's about to come. So the first concern is the health concern. I mean, obviously there are uh, considerations that the uh, population uh, must be healthy in the end of the day and that the health systems would um, uh, do their best to help it. Now, the question, what we see here is that the, the tension between democracy and health for the public. Now, don't forget that Israel just had um, a month ago uh, elections, no. less than a month ago, <laughs> elections. And um, so the regime is changing. There are restrictions that should be put on the population and uh, with massive steps that should be taken. How do you keep the balance between uh, the three branches, how do you keep democracy? And this raises lots of question marks, especially in a fragile time. And uh, the first thing that we saw was the decision of the Minister of uh, Justice to uh, restrict hearings in courts. This, is, this happened on Saturday night, 1 a.m., uh, while on Sunday was supposed to be the trial of our prime minister. 
Okay, so in terms of separation of powers, you're asking yourself, was this approved by the parliament? The answer is no. This was solely the executive, the, uh, executive decision of the Minister of Justice. Uh, we submitted at the same night, night, 2 a.m., a letter to Attorney General, yes, yes, our Chief uh, um, Legal Advisor, Dania Keel, 2 a.m., sent a letter to Attorney General and said, this is supposed to be, we understand what emergency situation means, but at the same time, it doesn't mean the democracy is falling apart completely. There should be some measures and some um, uh, supervision on, on things. This was the first stage. Later on, we learned that the, um, the, the, same, the, the executive branch, again, wanted to give powers to the Shin Bet, the security uh, services of Israel, to track people on cell phones. The way it was, it was um, submitted, again, by regulation, so no supervision of the Knesset. There is no Knesset. The executive director, the executive branch is, um, is uh, issuing orders, regulations, and uh, we thought these are severe. Um, the question, was it the, the last measure that can be taken? What are the alternatives? When do you use tracking on cell phones? Maybe in the beginning, it makes sense when there was one, two, three uh, people with the coronavirus, maybe it's important that the public will know where exactly they have been. But now when we have over 1,000, I mean, how do you learn? How are you protected? And also, uh, 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 on top of the Shin Bet, the same regulation, there was an authorization to every police officer in Israel, I repeat it, every police officer in Israel, to have access to the database of the cell phone companies. I mean, this is something really radical in terms of democracy. And the... Um, the story with the Shin Bedics was not only about patients, people that were identified as, pl as plus in, in, in having coronavirus, but also, as the regulations state, people in their vicinity. I mean, being uh, an attorney or legal professionals, what does vicinity mean? I mean, are we speaking about 100 meters? Is this the neighbor on the next building? Can we track everybody? Where are the checks and balances? So we were thinking, I mean, this was in the beginning, I'll, I'll, I'll say more, we are doing a lot of more uh, things, but a few days ago I had a conversation, I'm sitting in a board called INCLO, International Civil Liberties Organization, yeah. uh, which is, um, uh, CCLA is sitting there as well, yes, I know. <laughs> ACLU is sitting there as well, and we have colleagues from all around the world, from India, from Argentina, South Africa. And we were trying to, to get an idea of a global frame. Although we are all human rights, civil liberties organization, none of us says, oh, this is terrible. These are restrictions on freedom of transportation. We do understand the, the hour. We do understand the real problem that is there. The question, where is the balance and where, when do you throw the baby with the bathwater? And what does it mean on democracies? Where do you put the line? And uh, I'm afraid what we see here, that everything is being done by the, those ed executive regulations with no supervision of, um, of the uh, parliament, the, the Knesset, and uh, it's hard. We took two cases at one night to um, uh, Supreme Court, to Bagats, what is known, and uh, one of them, there was a hearing last week of five hours. I mean, this is really serious. And we ended up getting interim order saying that the Knesset must supervise this. So in terms of procedure, I mean, we were right. It's impossible to do it with no supervision. It's dangerous to democracy. On the other one, with, with the Minister of Justice, we are still uh, waiting for, um, uh, for the um, so, reply. I mean, yeah. it's, it's ongoing. Meanwhile, there is another hearing happening now against the chair of the Knesset, Mr. Edelstein, mm -hmm. that refuses to, to let the committees in the Knesset work. So uh, it's, it's uh, ongoing. The government should reply to nine, tonight at 9 p.m. It's ongoing. Things are going. So Acre is doing three major things at the same, at the same time. One is holding uh, all the issues with democracy, okay? The, the dem democratic space. What are the balances between protecting the population from the coronavirus and violating basic constitutional essence. This is one thing we're doing. 
Another thing that we are doing is civil liberties. Um, we had a huge success. Um, two days ago, we wrote a letter to the uh, national television broadcast asking to um, translate to Arabic. 20% of the population in Israel are the Arab citizens of, the, of Israel. And the, all the coronavirus instructions were not translated in real time on the news. Mm -hmm. This was fixed since two days ago. Everything is translated. Okay. The third thing that we're looking at is socioeconomic rights. Mm -hmm. We are all, I don't know if you know, I didn't say, since last Sunday for nine days now, we're, most of us are sitting at home. So um, my staff, most of them are sitting at home. There are regulations that they're saying uh, no activities on the streets. You can do sports uh, by pairs and keep distance. No gathering of more than 10 people. Mm -hmm. and, but there is, um, the regulations from yesterday say that the right to demonstration is still there. If you keep, if you obey the coronavirus regulation, this is something we interfered two days ago. Uh, there was a, a parade. I mean, people are very um, original. So there was a parade by cars, okay? There was car convoy going this way. You don't violate the two meters between each other, right? Uh, with black flags on them in order to protest. They went to the Knesset, to the parliament, in order to protest against, uh, to, against what is happening to the democracy. And despite this was legal, uh, the police um, got an order to stop them. We wrote a letter to um, uh, Chief of Staff of the Police uh, asking about the nature of this regulation. And yesterday when the regulations were published officially, the right to protest were, was in there. So people can protest under um, the restrictions. Well, it's so important. It's so important for us to know what are the new strategies that are there to uh, to protest or exercise others' uh, civil civil liberties? I want to go back a little bit on on the protection of privacy and the cell data gathering. So, did I hear you that you actually won the the hearing on the fact that that Neset had to supervise? Uh, which means that it had to be done by legislation as opposed to simply by um, uh, an edict of the executive. Is that correct? That's good. It's semi-correct. We got an interim order. So the, on Friday, a uh, few days ago, the uh, Supreme Court said that this regulation uh, will um, um, revoke if the Knesset is not going to, uh, to go over them. And the, the deadline is to do, tonight at midnight. So probably the Knesset is going to sit tonight. Maybe they're sitting now. I don't know. So, but, uh, yeah. uh, so the Knesset, in a way, the Knesset can be called uh, to, uh, to validate uh, retro yes. uh, retroactively. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about, or are there some measures to actually ensure some measure of, uh, of privacy to the extent that the data could be uh, 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 eliminated eventually or use only for one purposes I, are, are there you know the traditional ways in which we try to impose uh, privacy protection while maintaining you know what sometimes is needed to uh, have access to the information that's needed for the police so um, the hearing at court was five hours we are not allowed in all of it some of the it was on one side with the shin bet that the judges can understand the regulation themselves. So we are not familiar with all the details, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there, there should be a lot of measures how to do it, what does it mean? Uh, people from isolation, someone wrote a column yesterday in the paper, a person that is uh, with a coronavirus in, a, uh, in quarantine in a hospital. And he said, there is a camera in my room. And I don't understand why, because the door is locked. I'm in quarantine, I'm obeying. Why should someone watch me 24 hours a day? He tried, he said he covered the, uh, the camera with, with a glove. There, everybody's with gloves now, right? And, uh, uh, and then the loudspeakers were saying, please remove the cover from, from the camera. Big Brother is watching you basically, right? It's 1984. Do we need all these measures? I mean, what's the balance? Yes, we do want to protect the population from the coronavirus. Um, 
I'm sitting at home. There are no uh, uh, schools. Um, uh, lots of people were uh, sent to unpaid leave. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard economically. I mean, if we are looking about the next phase, it's the it's the economic thing that is a big issue. People very soon wouldn't have money if you don't have a safety net. And this evening, I wrote a letter to the prime minister about it that we are asking uh, safety net for the most vulnerable population. Um, uh, not only people with disabilities, but also uh, asylum seekers, migrant workers, uh, Palestinians workers. We're dealing with them as well. Uh, Palestinians workers are coming daily into Israel. And this week, the government allowed them to stay in Israel and not to go out uh, because of the coronavirus. And this is hard. They're staying in building construction. We have to ensure that some of the basic uh, b basic uh, dignified existence would be ensured for them. And uh, also we wrote a letter asking to stop the house demolition at this stage because in, in the occupied territories, people are sitting at home the whole day. I mean, this you have to understand on the daily life, not easy. I have two daughters, <laughs> teenagers, not easy, believe me. <laughs> well, I, I think we all around the world is we're looking at uh, restrictions on our privacy, restrictions on our ability to, uh, on our mobility, uh, restrictions on our ability to communicate uh, except online, which is the only place where we're still allowed to communicate. Uh, so you are connected with the, uh, in the other uh, organizations throughout the world. Is there yeah. something that is being done on the international front as part of INCO, yeah. the international network? Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. What we did, we all the EDs together, 13 of us were online and we were on a Zoom conference and uh, we tried to figure out to portray what is happening in each country and it has to do with the corona spread as well because when we were speaking with uh, Kenya and India, they're behind us to some extent, mm -hmm. uh, not because they're doing well, I'm sure like in a month, it's going to be a disaster in third world countries uh, where hygienic and quarantine is going to be a big, big problem. But we are ahead in terms of measures. I mean, we follow, all of us, we follow Italy and we follow China and we try to figure out how to uh, prevent and what to do. In other countries, Hungary is to some extent like us, Britain today announced that they, they will try uh, tapping phones as well. I mean, it's it's on a discussion. So um, I guess we're not the only one around the, the world that is dealing with it. Um, um, Ireland is also concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was scheduled to come to Canada, and this was uh, scheduled a year ago, um, when it was canceled, I was the first one among INCLO who was, was supposed to have the General Assembly in, in uh, Toronto this week. I was the first one to cancel. And then England and then Hungary and then we, we see you know we, we see the move the coronavirus moving with the restrictions and I guess um, I didn't follow the Canadian numbers today but I guess you're a few weeks after yes. us. I mean good luck. Yeah I think we're we're all in this uh, experience. I saw on your website that you were also doing some protections of tenants rights on the for the coronavirus. Wow. What, what, what does that mean? That gives us ideas here in Canada about what should be, we should be looking for. So actually, actually, I did today comparative, uh, it's not comparative law, but comparative reading. And um, Canada was announcing uh, protecting uh, tenants, I think, the, the special fund just before us. Today it was published in one of your papers, I don't remember which, but um, so the socioeconomic, I said we're doing three things now. The main thing is democr dem democracy and corona. Corona and human rights. How do we deal with it and uh, the separation of powers and how, how we defend our democracy. This is the main thing that we are doing now. And another thing we're doing is civil rights. And the third thing is the socioeconomic rights that will be on a rise. And how to protect the most vulnerable population like uh, paying rent at this stage with where, where most of the people are not working impossible just impossible how do you defend tenants uh, we wrote to the banks asked not to um to to uh, cut the debts at this stage 
And the banks are changing the regulation. We got very good compliance on this thing. Um, national health insurance. A lot of institutions are deferring or postponing all the payments because everybody understands that people are at home. Nobody is earning money. It's really, really impossible to, to send to this. And obviously, you don't want to want to have homeless people uh, due to not be able to pay rent on unpredictable issue. The good news on this stage that it's a it's a general problem. I'm sure the government at some stage would, would have to confront it. It's not one person's problem, but it, it's a big thing. How do you defer payments? And what about their renters and their people who, you know, who rent? It, it's a big, um, it's like a domino, you know, kind of falling. Uh, I, people are invited to uh, send comments. And I have a comment here that says, uh, that suggests that maybe we should, um, you should explain the the difference between the attorney general in Israel uh, from uh, in Canada. In Canada, the uh, the attorney general is a member of cabinet. Uh, he or she is elected, and um, I think it, that's not the case in Israel. No, the the attorney general is nominated by the government in Israel. It's a professional uh, position. And uh, this attorney general was uh, um, appointed, as far as I remember, Mr. Netanyahu. And now there is an indictment. It's very fragile and very sensitive. So I invite people to uh, uh, click on the bottom of the, uh, the, of the screen that says uh, Q&A uh, and uh, put your questions up or, or email them to ben at, uh, ben at uh, nifcam.org. But we'll continue to talk. I'm, so how is it, how is this, after this third election, has things changed for you? Like, do you have access to, to the government? Can you negotiate with this government or not? So it's, it's really hard. I mean, for, for more than a year, we don't have uh, an active Knesset. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's really hard to promote things in, in many ways. We do deal with the executive. We do have cases in court, but in terms of legislation, it's impossible. The country is uh, is frozen to some some extent, and and now it's uh, really hard. Our results are even. Nobody uh, won uh, in a um, um, clear way. There is negotiation to form a coalition. I don't know where it's heading. Um, I think uh, the the Arab joint list that uh, got a lot of mandates is, is, is a player. Until now, the, uh, the our minority of Israel was never in the uh, coalition. And this time, they supported Mr. Gantz. So um, I don't know. It's ongoing. So the whole crisis with the corona is with an ongoing negotiation, with a, with a crisis on, on the elections for a third time. And that's why it's so dangerous to give so much power to the executive. I mean, the whole thing with the hearing, uh, hearing in courts to say, uh, to close, to shut the courts 100%, not, not 100%, but most of the uh, hearings in, in court, a day, the night before the hearing of the prime minister, it's hard to convince me that there was no relation between the two of them. And now, by the way, later on, I mean, this, this order of the uh, minister was for 24 hours exactly for the day, the Sunday that they were hearing of Net Mr. Netanyahu was uh, supposed to be held. And then it was uh, um, for seven more days, they, they uh, extended it for seven more days while we submitted a petition. And now it was reduced. So there is some limitation on hearing in court for things that are not urgent, which makes sense. You don't want people on the street at the same amount as before. We are taking so many precautions on, on so many things. But at the same time, you have to think twice where you put the restrictions on democracy. Well, I, because you can operate a, a court online just like we are now. I mean, isn't that uh, a, a possibility? Is that what they did uh, or are they not? Uh, no, no, not it was canceled. Uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu's hearing was delayed to May. It was just canceled completely. So um, you might say if this was the purpose, mission uh, accomplished, but uh, 
I'm not, I'm not sure here I'm going back to our fragile democracy in questions we are asking ourselves as safeguards of democracy in, in fragile times. So is it not possible, I want to understand, is it possible that civil liberties questions could be part of the negotiation around the coalition government? Is that ever an issue that's raised? <laughs> uh, you are portraying or imagining uh, normal. <laughs> no, um, so I, I started working as a legal intern with ACRI at 2000. And uh, at that time, in, in the whole world, I think there was uh, more um, patience for liberal values and human rights. And at, the, at that time, I felt like a hero. People were saying, oh, you're work, working for ACRI. That's wonderful. That's amazing. At this stage, after um, 10 years, and then NIF was suffering a lot from the delegitimization on uh, human rights and universal values. It's, it's hard to say there was a lot of... Uh, criticism on human rights values. It's hard to operate in general. It's less uh, mainstream. And the attack on the, what we call the shrinking democratic space, the attack on human rights organization and uh, supporters like Onomi Khazan started 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But this is not the severe issue. If we look at the past three years, the attacks are not, are, are not on the civil society, but they are more on the institutions and uh, like Supreme Court or like the Knesset. And this is far more dangerous for democracy. And so what, what if you imagine once coronavirus will uh, uh, diminish, what will ACRI uh, uh, look like and what will it want to do to uh, recreate the right space for liberal and democratic values? It's a question if it's the end of the world as we knew it. <laughs> so no, it I don't know. I mean, what we were doing before, our, our, what my, on my uh, work plan for a strategic plan for 2020, the coronavirus was not one of the items on the list. What was on the list uh, were, um, uh, we are dealing a lot with the occupied territories, but mainly we we're dealing with things within Israel. Freedom of speech was on the list in a, a very um, um, prominent uh, way. Also, women's rights. Women's rights is not something ACRI dealt with in the past 20 years. We led during the 90s the most landmark cases, uh, precedents in Supreme Court about it. And we stopped dealing with it, not because it was not important anymore, but because there were other organizations that were doing a great job about it. And uh, because we thought we should move on with the next thing after we paved the way, this is the work that ACRI is doing, paving a new way and then other organizations are coming in, which is, which is fine. Uh, but what happened in the past two or three years, we see shrinking uh, space for women, exclusion for pub, uh, from public spaces, and we started dealing with women's rights as well. So women rights, transgenders rights, okay? LGBTQ community is doing uh, relatively well in Israel. Uh, and a lot is attributed to the, work, to the work that ACRI was doing during the 90s. Most precedents in Supreme Court were, were by ACRI. And uh, now we're dealing with the transgender community. Uh, our minority within Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, socioeconomic rights, portfolio of the human rights as an organization in not Corona times, you know. Well, uh, th there's some questions coming online about, uh, do you know whether other countries have um, canceled hearings or, or limited courts uh, applications? Uh, that's one question. And I have also a couple of questions of how do you connect with your other human rights organization in Israel? Are they... Uh, Zoom? <laughs> are there... Are, are they... Is everyone on, on par on the fight against coronavirus or not? So as I said, I mean, um, some of them, like Colombia, Ireland, um, ACLU, and um, Hungary are already leading, mainly taking care of the vulnerable population like uh, asylum seekers. This is the first stage before getting into restrictions. We started hearing about restriction in, in England today. Uh, there are limitations. I, I guess they will increase. 
India and Kenya, for example, are not as worried as the other, but I think it's a, it's a question of time. I think, again, when it will get to these countries, it will be a disaster. I don't know, I mean, I read today about Brazil. How do you keep uh, quarantine in favelas? Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, what do you do? How do you give health services in countries where the health services are very poor and the hygienic, no running water? How do you keep it with no running water? We, Israel has um, a very good health system, central mm -hmm. health system, health for everybody. Um, it's deteriorating in the past few years because budgets were cut really severely. We have uh, the teams, um, the doctors, the nurses, and all the health teams are really doing incredible job, working very hard. And I wish them all the support and luck that uh, we, can, we can get. I, I feel safe and I trust our systems, but I know it's really, really hard for them. I have a question here coming on the online here that says, uh, should Benny Gantz succeed in forming a coalition and become prime minister? Would he have the political capital and the political will, I guess, to roll back this, the COVID-19 safety measures and introduce more oversight to them? That's a, question, that's a question in prophecy. I'm afraid this is not my uh, field of... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have a clue. I, I don't know. I mean, this is really uh, for political commentators who should or what to do. I hope, I want to trust the leaders, the elected leaders of Israel, that they are interested in, in the good, uh, in a good future for the... Uh, citizens of Israel or uh, residents of Israel as well. My but sense of, my sense reading in Canada is people have, uh, are trusting more than leaders in times of crisis. That is, they kind of abandon a little bit the idea of fighting for their rights. So are you having trouble getting the population to uh, support your actions to create oversight on, on government? Or do you expose yourself to further criticism from, uh, from uh, the, the we, population we are, about even asking for oversight for COVID-19 safety measures? A lot of people are asking themselves at this stage questions, where's the line? Everybody understands that we, we have to stay at home and this is fine. But the measures that were taken seems to be so suspicious. I can say that ACRI got a lot of support Okay. Uh, public and financial support this week, despite the hard uh, uh, economic situation. Uh, people are supporting and offering support all over because we, it seems as if we were the first one to stand and say, this is dangerous, what is ha happening here. And it's about being balanced as well. It's not that we're calling for a full freedom of, of, of transportation or mobility or a movement. You know, it's, we're, we're not there. But we do ask for supervision of the three branches at the same time. And we do think it's dangerous that only the executive branch is having the powers uh, with no uh, supervision or auditing or criticism of the other branches. So, Natalie, I just wanted to double check um, that you saw that there's seven questions under uh, the question and answer tab. Uh, yeah, so let me uh, go through them. I had them on the side. So uh, let me um, let me uh, uh, read them to you, uh, Sharon and Sia. So one question is, will the Neset be able to vote on a new speaker so that the Neset can then vote on whether to enact the law bearing a person being prosecuted uh, or more crime from being given authority to try and head the new government? So will the Neset be able to vote on a new speaker? speaker or not? I don't know. This is the hearing now on the Supreme Court until 9 p.m. tonight that the current uh, speaker refuses to call the committees. I don't know. He was, uh, uh, Bagat, Supreme Court issued the decision uh, until uh, this afternoon. And already a already few um, a member of Knesset criticize the guts Supreme Court in a way that it, for me, I think it's unheard of. I think it's unheard of. So uh, I don't know. 
So uh, there was a, a, a story this morning headline, Netanyahu ministers bash high court coup. Uh, can you comment on this or does that uh, reflect back on what I, you said? I, I didn't hear this. I, I didn't hear this story, but what, that's why I uh, related this afternoon that I saw uh, some of the uh, comments and of some of the members of Knesset, including uh, Mr. Yariv uh, Levin, who would like to be the Minister of uh, Justice, that uh, um, that uh, uh, Bagat Supreme Court should be rejected or something like this. And I I'm, I'm surprised with uh, to hear such comments about Supreme Court of Israel. So. As there, you talked a little bit about the impact on the most vulnerable. Uh, as the pandemic affected the yeah. asylum seekers and refugees and their access to healthcare. Uh, yes. Yeah, so basically, in general, about healthcare, most lots of clinics. I mean, what is not, everything that is not emergency is the the routine things were cancelled or, or not happened. They don't want people to be on the street. Public uh, trans transportation was restricted. Um, so most of people are, are sitting at home. Now, the most vulnerable, I'm thinking about asylum seekers. There are 35,000 um, asylum seekers in Israel. And uh, most of them probably are working in tourism, washing dishes, waitress, kitchen. Um, I guess there is not a lot of social uh, networks. I mean. For most of us, if we are being uh, uh, fired, I mean, hopefully we do have one or two months that we can breathe. The government started giving compensation for people that were are on um, unpaid leave from uh, home. It's about 65% of their salary, but we are worried about those people that are not in this routine, uh, that are not eligible for compensation. And... Um, it's a question what will happen with them. We do understand that shortly will, the government will have to provide people with food. You can't stay at home, not work, and feed your kids, basically. Another question that came up is, to what extent will the joint list be included or excluded from planning for the pandemic? And are there any legal barriers to their participation? You know? Um, I don't know. I mean, there are no legal barriers. These are the citizens of Israel. They got um, a lot of support from the public. And I obviously think they should be included as equal citizens of Israel. What will happen if they really will be um, consulted with them? I don't know. So some people are, are commenting that uh, the, the approach uh, is... Uh, is a bit similar to Trump's attack on judges and the court, what's going on. Do, do you have any uh, response to that? I, I think there is, a, there is an attack on court. And I, I said the shrinking democratic space that we civil society is dealing with for a decade now, okay, especially as an IF, you, you felt it. First wave was against civil society organizations. In the past years, we witnessed the second wave, which is a lot of criticism on Supreme Court and Attorney General institution. I mean, this is big thing that we do feel now. And I think in terms of democracy, this is terrible. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, I think we're all concerned about how do we move to the next step? It seems across the, wor the, the world, uh, there's a real uh, devaluation of some of the liberal uh, values that had sustained uh, democratic empowerment for so many years. Are the uh, things that you should that you suggest that you think that Canadians uh, that are listening to you should should do to uh, help out in this regard? I think it's in emergency time. You see how strong is a democracy. This is the the real trial, mm -hmm. and um, we were contemplating with it for for a few years now, and um, we, we feel it's hard. I mean, the attack on Supreme Court and the, the blurred separation of powers, we do feel it. I hope that uh, Canada is not going to go through the same situation. The markers are there before. It's not only, I mean, 
this is the trial time, you know, but uh, the markers are much longer before there you can predict where, where it's heading, what does it mean? Um, I, I can say about my stuff at least, I mean, I'm, I'm very proud. I'm, I'm sitting here and, you know, blah, blahing, but it's not me. There are 45 people sitting behind me or working in front of their computers the whole week, 24 seven. The amount of work uh, Akri staff was doing uh, this week, dozens of letters, few petitions to Supreme Court. This is amazing, amazing. And um, as I said, it has to do with the infrastructure before. I have a very good staff, very good directors, very strong uh, legal department mm -hmm. and public department. You're welcome to follow us on our Facebook, on our website. We're updating all the things, not on our thing, not on our website. You could follow this week the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and a lot of our other outlets. We were all over uh, because we're doing a good and important work. Whether the outcome will be good for the state of Israel, I hope so. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Uh, Sharon, I have one closing question because it looks like we've exhausted all the all the ones from our from our viewers. Um, would you tell us about some of the um, inspiringly creative public protests that have happened uh, over the past few days? I think that I think is what one of the things that we want to see is, you know, do Israelis care? Is, is the progressive slice of Israeli life alive and kicking? And is it just you and, and the 45, 46 of you on your staff? Uh, or is there a, is, you know, uh, how big does it go? And I think some of those stories you told us yesterday were, were quite inspiring. Okay, I'll start with the, the humor. I mean, there are great jokes <laughs> on, the, on the social <laughs> network. Amazing. I mean, follow this. This is real fun. But I think everybody in such a, uh, anxiety that it leads those creative people are being led to, to good things. And uh, we're laughing a lot. No, but seriously now, a couple of things that happened. One thing is um, ha thousands of people on the car convoy. Okay, we're not allowed to be outside together. So a car convoy is brilliant because you're allowed to be alone in the car and you drive. You don't harm anybody. You don't touch anybody. But you drive to the Knesset. This morning there was another one. So it's the second one in a week with the black flag, which, you, which is a black T-shirt, basically, on your window, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't need an aerospace engineering to do that. Get into your car and put a, put a T-shirt, yeah? And uh, I think this is brilliant. And it's following the coronavirus regulations, the medical re regulations that you don't want to violate. This is one thing. Another thing, there are huge demonstrations online. Yesterday, there was a, a demonstration held by an organization called Darkeinu. 150,000 people were, uh, uh, were watching few important speakers. The former Mossad, former Shabak, professor of uh, law, former uh, justice of Supreme Court, El Eliakim Rubinstein. Now, um, I spoke... Uh, I. I felt that the speakers were speaking to a huge crowd as if they were standing in Rabin Square or something. So I called my friend, uh, Professor Rifat Biton, who was one of the speakers, and I said, you know, I really felt, I don't know how big was the room you were speaking in, but it felt really big. She said, we were asked, the, the requirements were, think that you are standing now in Rabin Square because this is the size of the crowd that is watching you. Now, this is amazing because you could see the people were speaking to a crowd with all the manners of, of a crowd. Now, it's it's big thing. Now, the host of, um, of this uh, demonstration was, uh, w w digital demonstration was Lucy Arish. Uh, she's an anchor in uh, Channel One. She was in Channel Two. And she's also an Arab Israeli. The next day, she uh, the contract, uh, the Channel One ended her contract. Uh -huh. So this is a big thing that is being dealt uh, not by uh, by us, but uh, it's being dealt now. So it's a big thing. We're trying to be original. We're trying to do um, conferences. There are lots of um, uh, schools, for example. My daughters are studying three day, three hours a day. 
online. The teachers are doing things online. Incredible teachers. On primary school, all the teachers are not being paid, which I think is outrageous. No reason to do it. All the kids are sitting at home. To, to study online, it's an option. And, and I think those people should be paid. Teachers should be paid first. Um, it's, uh, it's hard. We're trying to be original. We are writing at night. We are trying to have this conversation with our staff to support them. And usually you see a child, you know, uh, climbing over the whatever. This is reality. Corona time. Yeah. Well, I want to say it, it's, it's amazing, uh, the work that you're doing. And I think we should uh, keep on connecting so that we can continue to have good ideas about how to recreate this space for discussion on civil liberties in this new environment that we all have to do. We will need more creativity, that's for sure. Thank you, Natalie, so much for moderating this conversation and bringing your considerable expertise to the issues of civil liberties. Um, Sharon, it's always a delight to hear you speak. Um, your work is so inspiring, and you know some of the some of those digital protests and, and virtual actions I think are really inspiring for us here as we all try to continue the work of social justice and democracy and equality in our own countries and all kinds of issues. Um, those are some brilliant ideas. I uh, hope I that... Got, uh, sorry, I got a couple more questions now. I just got one more. I, if I can ask a non-COVID question, it, it starts, many Jews in the diaspora, especially younger people, are disillusioned with the Israeli government's treatment of its Arab citizen and its Palestinian population. This feeling has increased since the Trump plan was introduced seems that a large majority of the Israeli population supports the government position and Trump's proposal. Any comments on whether there's any signs of change on this view and any possibility of optimism on this, this possibility? Can you comment on that? They should join liberal movements. I mean, this is the time uh, to do it. Sign up for civil society newsletters, be involved, try to understand what's going around, be knowledgeable. I think knowledgeable citizens is really important. I mean, uh, join us in the struggle. There's a lot more to do. I think that's a great transition to, uh, to uh, our, our close. Um, uh, Sharon and the agency that she heads is one of 10 of New Wizard Fund of Canada's funded projects, and they are one of nearly 70 projects funded by the global, uh, the global family of New Wizard Fund around the world. And uh, our function is to, um, is to identify those partners on the ground that are empowering progressive civil society, uh, to work with them, to train them, to organize them together, um, to support them in their work, and to give them the resources they need to do, the, to do their own job, as well as pursuing our own projects, um, particularly public policy related and advocacy related, and ensuring that the social sector at large is able to um, is able to be heard in the halls of government at all levels in Israel. So one of our enduring priorities is identifying and mobilizing, especially young Israelis, as well as young diaspora Jews all around the world to meet each other to connect. Just uh, a week ago, or two weeks ago, before the um, before these um, uh, travel restrictions really came into effect. Um, here in Canada, we had, uh, in, in Toronto specifically, we had a really impressive uh, 20s and 30s town hall where um, uh, a dozen very important young leaders came together to consider how is it that they can increase the prominence of these, the consideration of these issues, engagement in Israel from a, from a liberal and progressive place. Um, and the, that meeting was also incredibly inspiring, and I hope that uh, all of you who care about that issue will be connected to us and will ask us how you and uh, the young people in your lives can uh, take meaningful action um, to support people like Sharon and to get to meet the many incredible staff that she has. Um, we will continue to offer virtual gatherings like this in the coming weeks. Um, I think uh, there will be no shortage of interesting and intellectual engagement at home for those of you who might be going stir crazy. Um, please, we will, uh, please do um, stay in contact with us uh, here, the staff and the leadership of the New Israel Fund of Canada, um, and stay tuned as we share many more important stories, breaking news, and inspiring updates about 
um, the work that our projects are doing on the ground in making Israel a better, fairer, more equal place in the age of coronavirus. So thank you for joining us. Thanks again to Natalie, and thank you to Sharon. Good luck with your work. We think the world of you. Thank you. Thank you.